Well, good morning, everybody. Um, and it's lovely to be here during Advent, one of my favourite seasons of the year. So as we turn to God's word, let us pray. Heavenly Father, in Advent, we hear familiar verses from the Bible, but we believe that you have something to say to each of us today. Open our ears to hear your words. Amen. So wake up. Imagine you are fast asleep in your comfy bed in the middle of the night and somebody suddenly turns the light on, shouts wake up at you and then throws a cup of water over your face. What a shock to the system. Has that ever happened to you? This is the picture that Bishop Tom Wright uses to start his commentary on this passage from Mark 1. His point is that the Jews have been slumbering gently under Roman rule. They had read that the Messiah was coming, but they weren't expecting him anytime soon. For 300 years, there had been no prophets and no word directly from the Lord. But John the Baptist was telling the people to wake up to the Jews. They weren't expecting a weird man telling them to repent, but he spoke with authority and people flocked to him. So three themes I want to explore today um, come across the whole three readings that we have in the lectionary, the formal readings for today. There's the reading from Isaiah, there's the reading that Johanna um, read from Mark, and there's uh, a verse from 1 Peter. So firstly, the big picture and the whole story. And then secondly, the person in the story of Christmas that everyone overlooks. And thirdly, what that means for us today. <clears throat> so firstly, the big picture and the whole story. We look back into the Old Testament. So when I was preparing this, um, I thought, do you ever take the Bible for granted? It sits on your shelf. This is the church one, all neatly divided up and compressed into one book. But it was actually a whole series of scrolls that were handed down and then put together. I mean, that's amazing. We sometimes forget about its authority, its authenticity and the incredible span of history it covers. The first verses in Mark show that the Messiah had been prophesied. The phrase, I will send my messenger before you, is actually from Malachi 3, so it's not even just from Isaiah. There, the priests were not fulfilling their duties. They needed a cleansing process. And the reading from Mark looks back to Isaiah, so I won't ask you to turn to it. But Isaiah started prophesying around 700 BC. He talks about judgment and salvation. And he warned that the disobedient Jews would be conquered by the Babylonians. And they were in 586 BC. So amazingly, for some scroll written by the prophet Isaiah and handed down, all of John's activities were foretold. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord a highway for our God. And in verse five, the glory of the Lord being revealed. So John fulfills these words of Isaiah all those hundreds of years later. He was very uncompromising. He was not like the uh, holy leaders of the time at all. He was actually a lot more like some of the Old Testament prophets, like Elijah, uncompromising, outspoken, so that brings us back to the idea of being woken up with water being thrown on our face. He used baptism as a sign of repentance, the first step to a changed life. So the Jews were used to ritual clean, cleanliness. But what is striking in this passage, and you might not even think it, uh, is that calling people to baptism here was uh, a process used to convert Jews to gent uh, Gentiles to Jews. It was not actually meant for Jews. It's quite a radical idea that John was bringing. And it looks forward to why Jesus came, not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. So we see another prophecy fulfilled, repentance and baptism in this passage. But secondly, who is the person that everyone overlooks here? If I go back to Isaiah 40, I didn't read from verse one, I started at verse three. But those of you who know your Bibles or have sung the Messiah by Handel will know that the first verse starts, comfort, 
Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for. Now, who do we know is the comforter in the Bible? It's the Holy Spirit. So here is the idea of him at work in the ministry of John the Baptist, but looking back into Isaiah, the idea of the Holy Spirit. John says that Jesus will come and be powerful. John baptizes with repentance. Jesus will come with the Holy Spirit. That's the last verse in the passage. And then in verse 11, we see the Holy Spirit coming on Jesus. So John fits into the Christmas story, the story of the incarnation, because he shows us Jesus, the mighty saviour, coming in power and majesty, but he points to something and someone beyond himself. Baptism, being drenched with water, but one who is coming, who would drench people with the Holy Spirit. So water can cleanse a person's body, a person's life, the self the heart. Holy Spirit, the comforter we see in Isaiah. So this is the message of Advent we forget. We know, of course, the Holy Spirit was involved in Jesus' conception, but then we focus on the baby in the manger. But Simeon in the temple, when he awaits Jesus, the one who would comfort Israel, he knows um, that it's the Holy Spirit who's coming. So what does that mean for us today? You may well say, ah, well, Isaiah was a prophet. He was especially called, so he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And we know that John was filled with the Holy Spirit, as we found that out in the passage about his birth from Luke in the story of Zechariah last week. And well, of course, Jesus was God's son, so he was part of the Trinity. But Jesus promises at his ascension, recorded in Acts 1, John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean for us now? Each of us at our baptism is blessed and filled with the Holy Spirit. So how do you respond to that gift? The Holy Spirit gives us power to change, to have a God-centered life. I want to read now a very short extract from a book I read over half term from Corrie Ten Boom's um, Hiding Place. If you've never read it, it's a classic book of encouragement about a Christian life. She was a Dutch woman who suffered under the Nazis in the Ravensbrück concentration camp during the Second World War uh, for hiding Jews in her house. Her sister, Betsy, had died there under appalling conditions. One day after the war, an ex-guard came to the church where Corrie was preaching. He sought her forgiveness for all the murders he had committed. And I'll quote, I stood there, I whose sins and again and again had been forgiven by God, but I could not forgive. I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. Jesus, help me. I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. You supply the feeling. And so I thrust my hand out into the one stretched out to me. As I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, and this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Corrie was able to forgive even Betsy's death because of the power of the Holy Spirit had given her the power to forgive. So are we Advent people? We continue to think about Rachel's words from last week. Our head, our hearts and our hands ready for God's kingdom. All this can only be done through the work of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that prompted the prophets and empowered John the Baptist and came down on Jesus when he was baptised. In Acts 9, it says the church in Samaria was being built up, walking in the fear of the Lord, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, back to those words in Isaiah. And through that, it multiplied. So let's take a moment now just to know that each of us as followers of Jesus have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, the comforter in Isaiah 1, the encourager, he who prays with us when we do not have the words.
The final set reading from this Sunday is from 2 Peter 3, verse 11. And we look forward to being filled with the Holy Spirit continually, and then to Jesus' coming, which is discussed in 2 Peter 3. And he asks a question, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Stay faithful. So let us, St Augustine's, be a spirit-filled church where each of us expects the prompting, leading and encouragement of the Holy Spirit every day. So I'm going to finish with a prayer that the Church of England has been using every day this week in its daily prayer service. It's written by Richard Baxter, who was a Puritan, who was born in 1615. He was a preacher, but he was also a leader in pastoral work in the church. So as we finish, let us just pray together. Keep us, O Lord, while we tarry on this earth in a serious seeking after you and in an affectionate walking with you every day of our lives, that when you come, we may not be found hiding our talent, nor serving the flesh, nor yet asleep with our lamp unfurnished, but waiting and longing for our Lord, our glorious God forever. Amen.